Hey friends, Mike Myers here with the Songwriting for Guitar podcast, episode number 41, Jody Friedman. Okay, between you and me, let's be honest. Strumming is not a thing that most guitarists do well, especially songwriting guitarists. They only have this one pattern that they seem to use over and over and over again. And most of the time, what's crazy, and I've seen this pattern they don't realize it. They don't realize they have a default strumming pattern. We all do. And if you don't realize that, guess what? That's why all your songs sound the same. So here's what I want you to do. Go to songwritingforguitar.com, click the three-day strumming bootcamp. This is completely free, and I'm going to walk you through my system of how you can create unique strumming patterns, start to mix things up, start to identify what is your strumming pattern. When should you change it? When should you not change it? Listen, I've seen so many songwriters go into this free training series, come out on the other side with a better understanding and better tools to implement cooler strumming patterns that work for their song and not against their song. So remember, just go to songwritingforguitar.com, scroll down when you see three-day strumming bootcamp, just click it and you'll be enrolled. I met Jody years ago at a music licensing conference and I heard him speak and the resume that he has, he's done things for ABC, CBS, Sony, uh, Cinemax, uh, Hulu, Netflix. He's worked on Won't You Be My Neighbor. And he has a great way of how to navigate this world. But more importantly, he was so good at demystifying and breaking down so many myths that songwriters carry when it comes to sync licensing. So believe me, this is an episode you want to listen to and listen closely. So we are just going to jump into it. Episode number 41, Jody Friedman. Now, I find your story interesting, and I want to get into some of that, but also to how you've been helping songwriters uh, with their your knowledge of licensing, navigating that world, which for so many songwriters seems like a mystery. It's like, how do I do this? They hear the word sync, and sometimes there's a lot of preconceived notions, and I feel you're very good at eliminating a lot of those to make it tangible, understandable, and more importantly, what you can do, what are some of the first steps? But I guess the question is, how did you get into this world of music supervision? Because it's just like, how do you start? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I started, uh, I was a TV production major. I was a media production major. Um, but before that, just going back a little further, I, uh, I started writing and uh, playing guitar when I was 14. I'm 41 now. And, uh, you know, I started writing right away, learned to sing or practice, 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 and finally was singing in, in key a little bit while I was playing about two years later. And then I was a song leader for my, my youth group when I was younger. So I kind of cut my teeth performing in front of a lot of people uh, for the Southeastern United States. And uh, then I went to school for TV production. Out of school, I got a job at CNN in Atlanta. I was doing audio production. I was an audio guy. I was a stage manager. I was working the teleprompter. They had a talent show called The Prompter Song. And uh, I'm sorry, the talent show was called the CNN International Search Talent Show. And it was around the time of American Idol season one when Kelly Clarkson had won. And uh, CNN was kind of trying to replicate that. So I wrote a song called The Prompter Song about my, my job. And I performed it at the uh, the talent show in front of all the executives and whatnot. And it, it won the grand prize, which was twelve thousand dollars, which was a lot. I was twenty two years old, so uh, you know after taxes, it was around seventy five hundred. And then, but it also just got me just what it got me noticed by my peers. So the next day, I remember being in work, and everyone was. Hey, great job. You did great. And they actually put like a, a plaque on the wall and it was a whole thing. It was really, uh, it was really something. It was really a fun time at CNN. And then what happened was that January, I transferred to New York uh, to help set up the Time Warner Center at Columbus Circle. So I was part of the crew that set that up. And then like a year or so in, I was still gigging around New York and I got uh, approached by the executive producer of the show. And he said, hey, we need this music for uh, this All Points Bulletin theme song for the show I was working on called Nancy Grace. And so I went home and in GarageBand, believe it or not, I took four loops from GarageBand and threw it together and included like a siren and a bass and a guitar and a little keyboard lick. And it ended up becoming the All Points Bulletin theme for the show. And at the time, I had no idea what licensing was but they wanted to do a license. And I knew that that was coming soon. And it just so happened that inside 
Time Warner Center was a Borders bookstore. So on my breaks, I would go and read about music publishing. And I learned about publishing uh, and fell in love with this idea that, like, ho- holy shit, I can, I can make money from music. Yeah. And, and without having to tour and gig and lug the gear and call the bookers and do all that stuff, which I was really just tired of doing at that point. Uh, so it happened that that first deal with CNN, because I worked there, like most places, if you work there and you do a license, they're, it's kind of double dipping. They're not going to pay you a license fee. So and MTV does the same thing. So the deal was gratis. And they asked me if I would do a direct license. And what that means is they wanted to buy out my performance income, my public performance royalties. They wanted to buy it out because they knew that that would affect how much they have to pay ASCAP yearly. And I knew enough by then, this was probably two months of going to borders and reading about it. I knew enough to say no. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I did because when I was moving across the country, uh, about a year later, I got my first royalty check for that theme song and it was 15,000 for the writer's side and 15,000 for the publisher side. So my first royalty check ever was a $30,000 check, which is very unusual. Uh, and I was naive and I thought that I was going to get 30,000 the next quarter and the next quarter and forever. Like that was how royalties work. It wasn't how it worked. It was like a one-time deal. So I was in California with that $30,000 and whatever I had in savings, which wasn't a lot. And I started just pounding the pavement for working with supervisors and getting into licensing. So I started in this business as a music licensing person. I was first pitching myself. I learned very quickly I needed to start representing other people if I wanted to succeed. I needed more genres than just what what I was able to do, which was acoustic folk. So um, I started signing other people, whining and dining music supervisors. And then in 2008, about two years later, my buddy from college called me up and asked me if I would come and act in his film. It was an indie film he was making. Went up to LA. I, I played this part of, uh, of Ryan Adams. He wanted me to play Ryan Adams because he thought I'd look like him and I could play guitar on stage and whatnot. So I played the role. And then afterwards, I talked to my friend Luke and said, you know, do you have a music supervisor for this project? He said, no. I said, well, I can help. So he let me help. So I had a $40,000 budget and we had to clear about eight songs, including Ryan Adams and Whiskey Town. And uh, there was Alexi Murdoch. We used an Alexi Murdoch song. And uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was baptism by fire. I kind of, all that I knew was what I had seen on the licensing side. I've got a few licenses at that point. So I understood a little bit about how it worked, but you know, I, like anything, you kind of, sometimes you just got to take a leap and dive in. And I hate to interrupt, but that you said yeah. the word cleared and some people are like, well, what do you mean cleared? What do you mean? Uh, what, what does it mean to be cleared? Oh, the music you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So that what that means is when you use music in a project, you have to secure the rights as a supervisor. It's the supervisor's job to secure the rights to that music. So I can't just go put a Kanye West song in a film and then somebody pays them. It doesn't work like that. You have to reach out to the publisher and the label and say, we want to use this Kanye West song in this project. And here's here's what we have to pay. And here's the rights we need. And they have the right to say no. And, uh, you know, you hope that they agree to the terms and then you do the license. It's kind of like a, a lease, you know, putting a lease in place with a, uh, a landlord and a renter. So the landlord would be in this situation would be Kanye and his agent would be his publisher and his label. And then the, uh, the renter would be the production company saying, we want to lease your song for our project and use it in the project for so much so much time we're going to use it it's going to live in this project for a year or perpetuity and we're going to pay you x amount of dollars and and all of those terms weigh into what the fee is whether it's north america only or worldwide or uh, uh you know if we need tv rights if we need theatrical rights if we need dvd or streaming so that all that all plays into it i feel like your story too of going to borders and just reading up it's like the form of self-education it's that sort of, you know, you can go to school, but sometimes when you find what you want to do, it, you have to navigate the waters. Okay, what don't I know? There's a lot I don't know. I need to start reading. I need to start, you know, absorbing books. Were there certain books that really stuck out to you that were super, super helpful in the, in terms of starting to understand this world? For sure. There was one that I gathered called um, 
uh, Music Publishing, a Songwriter's Guide. And it might be outdated now, but it's still the same principles apply. It's by a writer named Randy Poe, P-O-E, like Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, I recommend it anytime an intern uh, asks me for books or anyone who wants to work here asks me for some books. I recommend three. One of them is uh, All You Need to Know About the Music Business by Don Passman. Uh, Another one is Randy Poe's uh, Music Publishing, a Songwriter's Guide, because he takes you through publishing from a songwriter's perspective. And uh, publishing is all about the song. So if you write songs, you are a publisher. And this book takes you through what that means to be your own publisher, what that really means. What else? The third one is Making Music Make Money by Mm -hmm. Eric Beal, who uh, for years was teaching at Berkeley. I'm not sure if he does anymore, but I really liked that book because he had it was a fun read and uh, it taught me a lot about monetization of music and what to look for and what not to look for. I feel there's a lot of people that have preconceived notions about music in general. They think, I can't really make music that much. I can't make money from it. You know, I, I, you know, I tried to do a band. It didn't really work out, but it seems then they hear about licensing and they're like, oh, that's interesting. Can you make money from licensing? And they jump in and they're like, all right, let's do this. I, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a Google ad. Let's go. And then meanwhile, they're just like in a year, oh, nothing happened. I guess it wasn't meant for me. There's a lot of misconceptions about licensing. What are some common ones that you see some artists doing that are just well-intentioned, but a little sloppy? It's a great question. Well, I think uh, with licensing, you have to understand that it's not, I mean, it is about the music. It is about the music, but it's also about the content. It's about the, the projects that you're pitching to. So you're no longer working in the music business. You're working in the entertainment business, film and TV business. So the people who create that content, the filmmakers, and these days it's the YouTube producers as well. You know, any producer who produces content that is then absorbed by the media, by the or by uh, not the media, but by consumers, uh, those are producers, and that's who you're servicing. So when you're creating music, it's not always the case that your music is going to be right for it. And that's a hard thing for artists in particular to try to uh, pull themselves out of their art and then put their producer hat on. And that's what it is. It's, it's thinking like a producer and which producers, by the way, are still artists just as much as artists are. They, there's an art to producing. So you don't sacrifice who you are by taking off that artist hat and saying, I'm going to produce something that's not for me as an artist. I think that that's probably the biggest, that's the biggest hindrance I see with artists is the, the, the ability to remove the ego and think about it like a business about what's most marketable to these content creators. Especially saying, get the ego out, leave it at the door. Like it doesn't, it's, there's sometimes we're very attached. Certain songwriters are very attached. This is my song. But as you explained it, it is a business. It's it's serving a purpose. And you have to understand that it's like, I don't think we have architects. They're like, oh, no, no, no. I only build buildings that are just like this particular style. It's just what I'm attached to. They have to make changes based on zoning and building, co- like wherever they're doing. Now, when it comes to producing, I feel I've seen this to where people are like, ah, oh, this is good for sync. And it's like, what do you mean by that? And sometimes I'm like, oh, you you have this as a throwaway song. You think it doesn't really matter that you can just throw anything out there and it has a home. But there is a science and an art to understanding this does work, this doesn't work. Could yeah. you talk in more, could you get a little bit into that when it comes to producing and producers that are like, oh, I've got tons of tracks that are perfect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you might have a track that you you feel like you you could hear it in a TV show. I'll, I'll give an example. Somebody I, I don't even remember the name, but one of, one of my artists, uh, maybe in my community or in my course, um, they reached out and they were asking me, "Yeah, I have this Christmas song and it's perfect for Disney or Hallmark. And um, how do I reach the music supervisors for that?" So I actually started interacting with them and I said, "Well, I was trying to pose the right questions to make them think." which Disney movie, which Disney show, which Hallmark movie. And they said, well, just all of them. <laughs> so yeah, it, it doesn't, there's no, sure. There, there are some songs that could be universally thought of as it's perfect for 
a Hallmark movie. All right, that's great. So now which one? So that what I was trying to do was prompt that person to dive into doing some research so they could target some Hallmark films that are in production. And Hallmark Christmas now is year round with Hallmark. They've got the Hallmark Christmas channel. So if you have Christmas songs, it's not, there's ton, a ton of content, but you have to time out your pitch right. You have to chase down that particular film look who's supervising, contact that supervisor. So I have a song I think might work for your film. Obviously with a film, you can't research like past usage like you can with TV, mm -hmm. but there is a general um, tone of the Hallmark movies. They're all actually very formulaic. My wife watches the Hallmark movies and she can tell you exactly what's going to happen at the end of the movie, at the start of the movie, because they're all the same. But with it, with the, in that regard, the music's also very much the same because they're they're a very branded network. Disney's a little different, you know. Disney now is Marvel and Lucasfilm, and they all have kind of subtle different tones. And then Disney sh shows for kids are way different from films and whatnot. So it's uh, you just got to be more focused. I'm not sure if this is answering your question. No, it, it absolutely is. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that, that focus. I'm, it's like when someone comes to me and like, oh, I love writing in rock. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because we can go into so many different subgenres. Can you name where would this sit in a playlist? And I feel like what you're saying is the clarity piece gives you, it's not limiting you. It's actually giving you exactly where it needs to go or it's showing you, you thought it was good for this. It's not, it's actually great for this instead. Now that you've done your research, and I feel when I got into one to start writing for licensing, that was a big thing. It was, yes, it was writing, but it was a lot of research of just sitting there on Tune Find, iSpot TV, and like listening and being like, oh, it's interesting. There, there's patterns. There's some things I noticed. This supervisor likes this type of band, this type of band. It's understanding that so you don't necessarily start throwing stuff at a supervisor that's almost wasting their time when it's not meant to be there at all. Yes. Yeah. 100%. And if you're looking up a show that a supervisor uses music on and you see that trend of like their, the taste that that supervisor has, like a um, good example, Ryan Murphy, you know, he, which he's now calling himself a music supervisor as well, because he's very involved with the music decisions. And Amanda Creek Thomas is his supervisor, but he, they work together to make their choices. You know, they have things that they like, the style that they like for their projects but you've got to like take in the whole picture. You might watch an episode and see that they used a country song in this one episode, but look at the whole season. Was it just one country song? Cause then what was the context of that country song? Was it in a, in a bar? Was it in the South? Was it for the character? Cause what, what a lot of people, I think what the mistake that they make is looking at that and saying, Oh, cool. They use a country song. That means they're open to country. I'm going to send them a playlist of country. And while that, that somewhat makes sense because they saw that they used country, it might not make sense for the whole picture. The whole picture of the project might not be country. So when you're, when you're blanket pitching like that and saying, this genre is great for you, you just want to be, you want to be careful with that because some supervisors get annoyed with that, right? You don't know what's great for me. I'll decide what's great for me. Send me the link. I'll listen. Don't tell me it's great for me. You, what you can do is say, love the show. And don't, I, I've actually gotten some that are so clearly they're, they're BSing me. Uh, so clearly like, Hey, I really loved your work on this and this and this. Sometimes I'll reply and say, Oh, what was your favorite use? <laughs> you know, just mess with them. But you know, uh, there's sometimes you can kind of sense the genuine aspect of it. And you don't need to do that too. I mean, supervisors, I think are more inclined just to listen if there's like a quick blurb and a link and just shorten to the point. But I think I'm getting on a tangent here, but I, uh, I yeah, think, but save I, me. <laughs> it, I, this is yeah. why I think your class is fantastic. License your music because you're approaching it from, you know, being in that situation, getting inundated with songs over and over. It's like, that was, you saw patterns of like, people do this a lot that you know uh people need to stop doing this okay they're doing this right but to be a songwriter that's very fresh unsure and then to jump into your class it i feel like you're giving them you know years worth of knowledge that you've consumed in this world to know where to step 
this is how to start to approach. And before you do this, here are all the things to check beforehand. Yeah, 100%. You've, you've got to uh, educate yourself and take in the whole the whole picture. So, you know, I have my master class, which really takes you through the process, the licensing process, starting with the fundamentals, going on a representation and rate cards. Uh, then we go on to um, who the gatekeepers are. We go on to how to pitch your music. Then I take them through actual the process, like it's the, the, what a quote, a quote request looks like, and they get a template they can keep a uh, license, a master and sync license, which they can keep that template to uh, a letter of confirmation and then what to do when someone's interested. And that's that's what that part is. So if someone's interested, you're going to you're going to receive those documents. So but that's I, that, that's the, at the end of the course, because there's all this education that comes before that. You've got to understand copyright. You've got to understand master and sync and just the landscape of music licensing in this space. And then with the gatekeepers, my, my module five about the gatekeepers is how music supervisors think. And I take you into that so you can really get to know your client. Now, that said, my masterclass is kind of an, an overview for people who are just starting out and kind of maybe have like five or less licenses, I would say the masterclass is for. And anybody could take it and probably take away something. We even go behind the scenes on uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which is a film I music supervised, and I show them that process of, on that film. But uh, what I decided to do, and this this launches in a week, I don't know when this will air, Mike, but this launches in Ju on July 26th. It's going to air next uh, week, so it works out. So this is perfect. Oh. <laughs> Well, yeah, so in, in our Facebook group, uh, License Your Music with Jody Friedman, which is the public group, we'll be doing a ton of giveaways all week because we've got a launch and a lot of free giveaways and extremely discounted rates. It's going to be crazy cheap. But the course that I'm launching is called Pitch Like a Pro to TV and Film, How to Pitch Like a Professional Music Publisher. So this course will take you through the pitching process. And we start with some fundamentals. We start with, in, and then we go into who the gatekeepers are again, and then understanding and interpreting briefs, which is an art in itself. It takes sometimes years to master that. Now, and, someone uh, listening to this yeah. and they're like, what does this have to do with underwear? And then you're like, that's right. not a brief. What would a, a brief be like, kind of a short explanation of a brief? Yeah, so... Uh, a lead, a music lead. It's like I receive emails every day from different music supervisors or producers or editors that are looking for music saying, hey, we're, we're working on this project and we can't afford this Coldplay song. Here's the, the budget. Here's a description of what we need. Here's some references. Can you send us your ideas? And these briefs go around to reps, uh, publishers, labels, the majors, you know, Sony, Universal, Warner Chapel, they get the same briefs as the indies get, you know, an indie being independent labels, independent publishers, independent reps, uh, and libraries, music libraries, which are also essentially independent labels and publishers uh, with a large amount of music. So these briefs that come in, you have to learn to and how to interpret them because every every person that will send it to you, it's going to be coming from a different individual. And that individual will have a different way of describing music. So it's when someone might say, hey, I really want it to be faster here. Here's a reference. And you listen to the reference. And for you as a musician, you're analyzing it and you say, it's 120 BPM the whole way through. What do they mean by faster? They didn't mean faster. They meant they want it to ramp up in energy. Mm. And, you know, there's you have to learn to discern and identify what they mean. Sometimes you can ask, but a lot of times they will not respond if you ask. So you really do need to uh, understand the briefs. So I take them through that. And then I actually do. I show them examples of pitches, the right way to pitch to a film. I do four pitches, the right way to pitch to a feature film. And I show them uh, a massive brief that I got where I pitched and pitched and it resulted in a placement. And then the wrong way to pitch to a film. So I take them through the wrong things to do, reacting to a different film. Then I do the same thing for TV, the right way to pitch to TV, to a TV show, and the wrong way to pitch to a TV show. So I actually, you actually watch me digest the pitch and go through my process and I talk them through it. So it's uh, a few people have taken it and from what they tell me that it's just, uh, there's nothing else they've seen like it. And it really helps them to understand briefs and, um, 
with the pitching, the pitching process. So if you're at the point where you're pitching and you're pitching and you're pitching and nothing's happening, like you mentioned earlier, this would be a great, great course for you. I love the fact that you do both sides. Like here's what worked and here's what, here's the opposite of it working because I feel there's even, there's so much value into seeing when things are wrong and to understand and start to realize like, okay, that's great to know this is the, this is the right way, but like, oh shit, I do that. I do that. That totally makes sense. Now why yeah. it hasn't been working? Because if you don't know, it's just like you're oblivious. But once you see, it's like you can't unsee. You just sound <laughs> like it's forever just in your head. That is so good. And yeah. no, I don't see sync classes out there because there's tons. You can't help but, you know, scroll through Instagram. It's like guitar class for me. Like somebody <laughs> learn guitar. And it's just like, yeah, but in the context of what? But to have your perspective. I think that's the value because there's so many that are just people that are like, ah, you can get this $200, you know, like, you know, uh, ad right here. It's like, yeah, but what about people that want to go after more and start to build a consistent revenue stream? I feel like yours does that way better than a lot of other ones that are very short and there's not really a lot to it, actually. Their classes are kind of just thin. Sure. I I can't speak to other people's classes because I haven't taken them, but uh, I appreciate the compliment. Thank you. (laughs) Dude, um, so this is happening next week. And if they want to find you and contact you or start to get involved with this, where can they go? Yeah, you can come to that group. It's on Facebook. It's called License Your Music with Jody Friedman. And you can also come to licenseyourmusic.com. And I've got a free guide right now called Four Simple Steps to Get Your Music on TV. So come on by and grab that and you'll be on the list. And then I don't spam like crazy. I'm actually pretty minimal with my emails. So you'll hear from me when I have something. Uh, actually, every every Wednesday, I have a free free YouTube video that goes out. It's also a podcast. And you can tune in our podcast, License Your Music, where we, we do a lot of free teaching too. So you could easily, easily come by and not spend a dime and learn a lot. Joey, this was awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. This was fun. And that does it for this week's episode. I just want to take a few moments and thank everyone for leaving us some rad comments over at Apple Podcasts, giving us five-star reviews, because believe me, I read every single one of them, and they mean so much because it helps bring notice to this podcast. You wouldn't be surprised how much reviews actually matter. So if you're enjoying it, you haven't done it yet, please just take a few moments, head on over there, talk about your favorite episode, and give us five stars. This episode was edited and produced by Chris Fafalius. I'm Mike Myers. Thanks for listening.